It was a stormy night on May 26, 2004. It was basically in the middle of the night, and suddenly I awoke to sound of thunder and lightning. I was still in a semi-state of consciousness at the time, but I remember hearing the intense loud thunder. So I looked out the window, I could see like lightning flashes you know, through the curtains. It was a very intense storm that evening. Mother was asleep in her room. I was or had been asleep in my room. And I was like, again, kind of listening to this. It was frightening to experience. Then I tried to calm myself down because I know that it was just, you know, thunder, lightning, and a very intense storm, more intense than usual that we experience around here. I kind of like decided to be positive about the experience and decided this was nature's way of cleansing the world and it alleviated my fear. There were a few more flashes of lightning. More thunder was taking place and it was just a very incredible experience to have since we were in, used to having this type of thing happen in this area here of New York. As I calmed down hearing this, I started to drift back into sleep. I started to dream, or so I thought it was a dream. And I started seeing this vivid experience. I remember that it was a knock on the door, our front door. I woke up. My mother, you know, woke up from her room. I started to wake up from the bed. I could see that she was coming out of her room. I started to come out of mine. I followed her behind the two, you know, the front doorway. We have a long hallway to go through to get to the front door. Mother opened the door. And there were these people, you know, standing there or so. But even before we got to the door, we saw that there were like these plainclothes police officers. And they were there, and suddenly they, they were inside of the apartment, at least the vestibule. They were all dressed dark. Um, I looked over, they had like an intimidating presence. And I just got the feeling that, you know, something was meant to frighten us here. So I was standing alongside with mother in the vestibule and I could see that these people were trying to be very intimidating and being almost frightening toward us, that they didn't want us somehow to to move away from the space or whatever. Um, we have our front door, our vestibule, which is part of the hallway, and then directly to the left, if you're looking from outside, our kitchen, you know, is there. And I remember seeing this person who seemed to be with the lead police officer or detectives or whatever standing there. And he was a bit short, I would say, compared to me, because I'm about 5'11". He must have been like about, I would say, 5'8 or so, uh, wearing a white shirt, a dark tie, dark dress pants. Looked professional, except he didn't have his jacket on, obviously. He had a short crew cut, kind of like sandy blonde hair. And then there were others. We could feel the presence of others. At least I could see it. I saw there was another person with dark hair. They came into the house or the apartment. Uh, they were in there, whatever. They were like, trying to take charge of things, from what I could remember. And But again, they had this intimidating presence that we weren't supposed to like see something or know something or do something. I felt that I wasn't going to be afraid or be intimidated by these people. Um, just as a sense of something that came over me. And they were speaking rather telepathically, not verbally really. It was more of a telepathic sense and a telepathic feeling. 
And I let them know that I was not going to be frightened by them. We were not going to do what they said. This was our home. And as I got more empowered, I felt that somehow that took away their sense of being able to frighten us, to intimidate us. From there, things kind of like went out of phase. Then I kind of remember going back into the experience once again. And whether you call it a dream or an alternate dimensional experience, which I feel that that's what this was more than anything else because it was too vivid, even though it felt like a dream and it kind of looks somewhat like a dream, but there was just too much happening that was linear. And there was progression going on here. And it was like we were in, I guess mother and I were in this state of going through this experience. So I remember going, going back there once again in the vestibule area. And there was this officer. I looked to my right and to the kitchen, went into our kitchen and saw that there was another one or two people there. And there was our kitchen table, the small kitchen table that we have. And then on the other side, we have our, our sink area. We have our kitchen top near there to prepare things, whatever. The stove is on that same side to the left near there towards the wall. And I remember that they had, it looked like, and they felt like they had set up some sort of camp you know, there. And I remember seeing some equipment like kind of like computers and one was on top of the kitchen table and they were like monitoring things and there was this lady police officer there dressed in the same way as the gentleman she had d dark hair seemed kind of short or at least tied up from the back and she was there and she was sitting in front of this apparatus i'll call it there was another monitoring device on the other side you're there on the counter there also and they seem to be like monitoring things for some reason you know, they there they use it like a headquarters our kitchen um, there was another officer there apparently was still coming in and out and we I know there were others in our apartment going back towards as well so I've got the feeling it was sitting like a good four or five of these people in, in our apartment and they kind of like just were there commandeering things and looking out for something or almost like being like, you know, like guards, you know, towards us and that we weren't supposed to do things. We weren't supposed to move out away or again, it was this intimidating presence. Um, I saw this guy there. I saw the equipment there. I'm looking at all of this and I'm saying, you know, um, I'm not going to take orders from you. Again, this is all very telepathic. This is our home. You can't tell us what to do. And they seem to like, you know, that seemed to take away their, their power. They just couldn't fight against that. They saw we were not going to be taken by them. We were not going to be frightened by them. They weren't going to be able to strong arm us. And especially me, because I was the one who was really more talkative here. Mother was just alongside. Right? At that point, even, even we're seeing her there or whatever. But, um, and it was like, you know, I took control of the situation. And there was nothing they could do about it. They kind of got silent. They had to relent to my will. And as I looked out from the kitchen and looked out from the opening there, I uh, saw so our vestibule, but it seemed to be a little bit wider than it really is here in this dimension. And there's a closet there, a wall closet, you know, there were sliding doors. And I stepped, you know, out there and then I noticed there were these beings these different type of people that were standing there you know right by the vestibule once again by the entrance of the door there was must have been like at least five of them from what I remember and I was just standing there near the vestibule and I remember them being very tall and very white and I said there were like four or five of them from what I remember 
and they look different from these other people who look more like police officers or like plainclothes detectives. These were like very tall beings, you know, there. I would say they must have been like six or seven feet in height. And as I said, they were like four or five just standing there. And they seem different. They seem otherworldly, for lack of a better way of saying it. And they were just standing there. And we were standing in front of them. And they were staring you know, at us. And then I remember just that faded out. If I recall correctly, I think I woke up again for a bit, you know, from the dream state, still being a bit like in between worlds. I guess it was still raining outside at the time. It was still late at night in the middle of the night at this point. But it seemed like the thunder and lightning subsided. But it was just raining. From there, I felt calmer because, okay, raining. And then I just went back to sleep, you know, from there. Once again, there was a knock from the front door. I remember, you know, getting up again. I remember seeing mother coming out of her room. Then I came out of mine because our rooms faced each other there. And she started walking towards, you know, we were just knocking. I was walking behind her. We were walking again down the hallway, you know, there. We have a dining room area here where we go all the way to the front of the apartment. There's the vestibule area, the front door. And then my mother opened the door. And then I looked out because I went before her. There was no one there. There's a long hallway, you know, in our apartment building. And at the long hallway, then there are three apartments near there. I remember seeing the middle apartment that the door was open. That belongs to our neighbor and my mother's very good friend, uh, Marion, you know, there. And we knew that the front door was open. And I could see you know, into her living room a bit because that's the way it is. This is a small entrance way there and you can immediately see into the living room space, you know, there. There was nobody there, just the door was open. So I'm looking out at this, I said, I remember, you know, that's odd because I know that Marion and her husband are away on vacation and they're going to be gone for at least maybe two weeks or so. So there's no one in that apartment, but yet the door is open. So I'm staring at this as I'm looking, you know, there from the vestibule of our apartment, looking out at this. And I'm just standing there looking at this. And then suddenly all of a sudden there's movement. And then I see a figure appear like coming from wherever from the apartment and coming out towards the front of the door and this being was or this person or whatever they were were bul bulbous looking they were these pink like robes they were kind of roundish this person they looked like almost like balloon figures from a parade and this person just started appearing from the door and started kind of like floating out and then floating down the hallway. And they started floating towards our apartment. And then there was another one that came out and started floating down as well. And then another afterward, they just literally started coming one after the other, floating like balloons in a way out of the apartment coming down the hallway and standing in front of our entranceway. They looked kind of holy in a way. They had this kind of like tall, like hairdo, kind of like silver or white or whatever. And it was seem that they had some sort of a like 
crown or something, very long and tall at the top, with these pinkish like robes. Um, they seem kind of like elephantine looking in a way. That's the way I could say it because they were like so big and so round. And there was another four or five, there was like four or five or six of them all together floated out and then just formed in front of our door. Then that space started to like almost widen, which is not the usual in our true state here. And they kind of stepped forward and came in to the front of our apartment, you know, entrance. And it was kind of wide. There was like five or six of them standing there and looking at this. And I'm there with my mother. My mother's there, you know, with me. And they were there and they looked kind of like, they looked spiritual. They looked holy. And then it was frightening for a moment. And I could feel my mother was frightened as well. Because, you know, what was happening there? I could feel that the other people were still there, these other police officers or whoever they were, like, were there. But somehow they, there was nothing they could do. They were just, at this point, they were just in the background. So we were frightened. I was frightened, but then I composed myself. I said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And calm came over me. I wasn't afraid. And we're looking at this and looking at these beings, looking at us. And all of a sudden, I looked down a little bit there and another figure just kind of like appeared or came from in between two of them or so. This was a smaller figure dressed in the same way as they were, however, looking in the same manner with the pink like robe, uh, the tall like hairdo with the crown or whatever there was on top of their head, but smaller. And as I looked closer, I suddenly recognized who this person was. And I looked in it, and it was my grandmother. And I could, and my grandmother was there, and she was kind of smiling. And it was as if these beings came and brought my grandmother with them or, or for her. They brought her to us. And when I saw her, I was like, immediately, because I said, Mama, Mama, you know, and because it's like, Mommy, it's Mama, because we used to call my grandmother Mama. This was my mother's mother, obviously. And everyone called her Mama. Uh, Mama had passed away several years before. Uh, she had passed away actually December 31st of 1992 at the age of 94 or 96 so she lived a long long time she was very healthy practically till the end um, my grandmother was a very spiritual person she was a very religious person she was born raised and lived all of her life in Puerto Rico and she was a devout spiritual lady she went to church every Sunday all of her life. She was one of the, um, as they call them, one of the daughters of the church. She belonged to that society, you know, there. She was very active in the church. And, um, and she was very well known throughout the entire town where she and my mother came from. Because she's, they, my mother, uh, my grandmother spent her whole life there. Um, so this, my grandmother was there. I told it to my mother. And my mother's, oh my God, I could see my mother like stepping forward. Mama, 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 you see her. She went, my mother was so happy. You could hear the happiness in her voice. And I could see my grandmother standing there, you know, looking there. And I just had the sense that they had brought my grandmother to see my mother and me. And it was very joyous. And then from there, it just faded. And then I remember waking up from the experience. And 
I could remember this, you know, very clearly. As I'm laying there, I say, oh my God, oh my God, this is incredible. What, is, what has happened? This is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. What's happened? And I started quickly reflecting upon what had happened about my grandmother, especially my mother. And I knew this was a visitation. I knew this was a sign of something good that had happened. And I started reflecting on the other events that happened just prior you know, to that. And I felt very happy. I felt very joyous. Then I think I drifted back into sleep again from all of that. And then I remember, I guess a while later or so, I woke up, you know, finally. And I looked at the clock. And it was exactly 6.30 a.m. And I remember, you know, looking at myself, this is exactly the time that I wanted to wake up, you know, today at 6.30 a.m. Because I had to get, I think it was, it was a work day and I had to go to work or later or so. And I wanted to get up at 6.30 a.m. And despite all the experiences and all the happiness that occurred that evening, I woke up and it was exactly 6.30 a.m. on the clock. It was perfect. And all the synchronicity was there. It was delightful. It was wonderful. You know, I sat back. I was absolutely thrilled. I said, oh, my God, I can't believe even getting up at 630. Exactly. This is incredible that this has happened. Um, so then I started being very, very happy and jubilant about this entire experience. But there's more to this. So. Going back to the evening once again, uh, because I got up and went to sleep at least twice, you know, prior to that, obviously, and having these experiences happen throughout the evening, in the middle of the night or whatever. What happened also was just as spectacular. So, after the experience or so or, or whatever. Because again, this all happened, it was like almost like a daze going through this entire experience. But after the experience with my grandmother and seeing her there and drifting back into sleep, in the middle of the night, once again, and I suspect it must have been like maybe around close to five in the morning or so. I didn't look at the clock or whatever, but just a feeling. I guess between 4.35 a.m. There was a knock on the door. And I woke up because I could hear this knock on the door. But this time, this was not a dream. This was happening in real time. And I woke up. And I remember sitting up on the bed and the knocking persisted. I remember seeing my mother coming from her room and said, what, what, what's going on? I said, oh my God, said, what's going on here? And I got up and then she started walking. I started walking behind her once again. And we started walking down the hallway and the knocking was there. And my mother said, who is it? And then we heard a voice saying, it's the police. So we were like, you know, looking at each other in a way, what's going on? So my mother went to the door, she unlocked it. I was standing right behind her, you know, to look through the peephole first. We saw some people standing there. And then so she, you know, they looked like police officers. And then she opened the door and opened the door. And sure enough, there were like five or six police officers standing in front of our door. Five of them were dressed in uniform. One was dressed in a suit, a plain clothes officer. And we're looking at them <laughs> and they're looking at us with concern on their face, their faces. And they said, are you all right? And then I said, yeah, you know, we're fine. We're all right. What's going on? because we were dumbfounded by all of this. And this, again, was happening for real, in real world time. And 
Then they said, well, we got a call to the precinct. And they said there was loud banging and noises coming from your apartment. So we were like, no, everything's fine. We're, we were, and I told them, you know, no, we were asleep. Everything is fine. But we, I also noticed or saw, and my mother too, that on either side of these police officers standing there, there were two of our neighbors from the sixth floor uh, because we live on the fifth floor and the sixth floor is the final floor in our building. So we saw to my right, Mr. D who lives, you know, on the sixth floor uh, to the apartment all the way down the hallway because we have the same format for all the floors here. So if you remember what I said earlier, we have a long hallway from our apartment and there are three apartments, you know, at the end of that. So Mr. D lives on the right side you know, apartment there. And then we saw our other neighbor, Michael, standing on the other side of the police officers. And he happens to live directly across from Mr. D on the other apartment on the left side. So they looked at us pretty concerned as well. And they were, you know, they were dressed in their night clothes, you know, there and they're staring at us, you know, looking at us and said, no, everything is fine. And then it, and we were asleep and we're looking at them bewildered and strange too because we don't know what's going on here and okay everything's all right for sure okay okay and then okay well then they said good night and mother and i went to the living room for a moment because we were startled by this experience what was going on here because we're not accustomed to anything like this ever happening you know, to us or here in this building at all we don't have things like that happen here regularly at all and so you know i know mommy sat on the sofa for a bit we like, what is happening so what's going on is that i don't know i'm standing in front of her you know anyway so i went to the window because we happen to live you know towards the front of our building up there i look out the window and it's dark and i see there's like five or six police cars in front of our building and I was like, oh my God, what's going on here? I told my mother, there's like five or six police cars in front, in front of the building here. I said, huh? You know, I'm like, oh my, you know, it was impressive to see that. And right there in the street, and I'm looking at this and my like, God, oh, what's going on here? And then like these three of them started going, they got into their cars and they started, off they went. There were still three police cars left, you know, there. And... You know, we were just there, and then eventually they left, you know, also, because there was nothing around or whatever. And um, then Mommy and I just stayed there for a little bit in the living room talking about what had just happened. I said, what could have happened? What could be going on? I said, this is so strange, all of this. It's just highly weird. And then, okay, well, it's over, this and that, and we calmed ourselves down, and then it was, I guess, in the middle of the night or so, and then, well, let's go back to sleep. So... She went back to her room. I went back to mine. You know, I was like, you know, what, what's going on here? You know, and we just went back to sleep, uh, which is kind of incredible to think we went back to sleep after all of that. Or at least, you know, because of the police being, you know, knocking at our door at that late hour you know, in the middle of the night, you know, and our neighbors as well presenting themselves there along with them. So, we, but, you know, but she went to sleep. I went to sleep as well. And, um... And then from there, like I said, I woke up again at 6.30, and I noticed it was 6.30, and then I was happy about all this business. Then I remembered also about what happened just before with the police coming to see us. And I'm putting all of this together as I'm kind of starting to wake up from all So, So, my God, what's going on here? This is incredible. First of all, this whole night of all these experiences that are going on, and then the police actually come for real, you know, and, and this, you know, all of a sudden at the end of all of this too, and our neighbors and whatever, and I'm piecing all of this together, but because I am psychic and I am connected to the spiritual, in, in a way it wasn't such a shock you know, for me. And it wasn't so, you know, so so you know, traumatizing you know, for me because I'm used to unusual and interesting experiences happening to me throughout my life. But yet even this was something surprising. And something to take, you know, me, you know, out of sorts as well. But because this is not the usual experience for me either. I'm traversing 
you know, realities and traversing experiences like this. So I, but luckily again, because I do have that in me and I do have an inner feeling of knowing about things like this happening. And I, it wasn't so shocking, you know, so, you know, so surprising as it could have been. So I was just busy, you know, starting to put the pieces together with all of this and realizing that this was a major experience that I had had or that we had had, even though mother doesn't, couldn't see it that way because she didn't have the experiences I was having, at least as far as I know. And she wasn't acting like traumatized or frightened or anything or whatever, except for this experience that happened, you know, to us, you know, in, again, real time here in this reality. I was the one who experienced things in the alternate estate that apparently she did not. And so as I'm waking up from all of this, I'm putting things together. So, so I felt excited. I felt exhilarated. I felt what's going on here. This is incredible. And what's going on? This is absolutely incredible. What's going on here? Then I remembered the date. And it's May 26. 2004 and I'm putting this together and I realized oh my god just two months earlier on March 26 2004 on a Friday evening my father suddenly passed away right here in the apartment at around I guess 8 or so or whatever because my mother didn't discover him until by closer to like after 8 maybe close to 8 30 or so he had passed away taking a shower so he passed in the bathroom and you know we weren't aware she wasn't aware she was in the living room watching television my father had a habit of taking a shower just before 8 p.m. every evening so this wasn't anything unusual for him to do. He seemed to be fine. It seemed, I know he wasn't feeling too well towards the last few weeks there. He had lost a lot of weight and there was something going on with him. My father had a heart condition for 14 years you know, prior to this. He had had quadruple bypass surgery in 1990 and he had had a minor stroke after that first surgery or so but he came out of it well despite that and even the minor stroke he came out of it well and he did pretty well after that and so well that you know he had a little problem with speech at the beginning there but he regained that a lot he spoke well he was alert well he drove he was able to drive once again he wasn't incapacitated greatly at the beginning of there a little bit with his memory and he had aphasia and uh, speaking was a bit interesting because he would mix up certain words. He had something called aphasia. He had a stroke on the left side of his brain. So that was the Wernicke's area and the other uh, areas that deal with memory and speech. But it wasn't severe or major and he was able to recover from that. The heart condition was another thing because he had to have surgery. You know, after that, after the heart attack or so, and he had to have quadruple by surgery. You know, for a while when he had a second heart attack after the first. But he came through that and he came out well and he lived another 14 years well until the very end there the last i would say three weeks many months or so there was something there he st i think he started feeling weak he was feeling something he didn't want to say anything really too much but he had lost weight you know, too, and it's like he wasn't feeling like himself and i had a feeling that he was probably gonna have to go to the hospital because he was getting a little weaker but there was no indication anything like him passing away because he was fine despite all of that and it was at the doctor's care the whole time you know that those 14 years and taking care of himself very well and mother taking care of him you know also so he lived well you know till the end so again he passed away unexpected unexpectedly and but it was exactly two months to the day that this experience happened so at that time this was a shock you know, because we were not expecting this two months prior. Um, mother, of course, she lost her, her husband of 50 years, or over 50 years at that point. 
uh, mommy was 80 years old at the time that father passed. So they had lived a long life together. And they were always very close, you know, for the most part, and always did everything together. And, you know, and it was just, you know, us here. And so that was, of course, a traumatic experience for her, you know, to lose my father, you know, after so many 50, half a century, most of her life. So that was a shock to her wedding experience. But, but we were getting through it. And, you know, we were in a state of calm and peace. You know, everything was taken care of, luckily, here. And she was going through that experience because it's a, it's a shock to the system for somebody, after all. And But she was, for the most part, calm and accepting of the experience or so. And going through grief, obviously, as one does through something like this. Uh, but so she wasn't in any state of, you know, turmoil or, you know, or whatever. She was dealing things with dealing things well in a state of calm, in a state of grace. Because my mother, you know, in that regard, she's very logical and knows that things like this do happen, unfortunately. And, and that that's the way these things happen, unfortunately. So it wasn't that we were in a state of shock or trauma or tremendous grief here, whatever, in those, you know, previous two months. We were handling things well. And then for this experience to happen like this. So I felt that this was a way to help my mother and to have my grandmother come to see her and to support her during this time in the alternate realm, the astral realm, whatever you call it. On some realm, my mother must have touched because she was there. She was part of this whole experience. So in some way, she experienced this. Even though she didn't experience it here in reality because I told her later on what happened about all of this so that she would know. She didn't have an inkling of anything like that. She didn't remember anything like this. She didn't remember anything about that type of experience in the middle of the night or so, except when the police officers came, when they knocked on the door and there was all these police there and our neighbors. That she knew because that was here. But prior to that, the rest of the evening or so, nothing. She didn't have anything like that. But I saw her. She was there in the experience. On some level of her consciousness, in some way, she received this experience and she had this gift of her mother coming to see her and support her during this time. That I know for sure. So, now we're like the next day, in, again, in our regular life here on Earth. <laughs> and my mother then started, you know, reaching out to our neighbors on the sixth floor. And Mr. D, you know, whenever she saw him, and uh, Michael, our other neighbor there. And then apparently from what we learned, what she learned, you know, um, the police went upstairs to the sixth floor. Uh, they asked the neighbors that besides Mr. D and, Mr. and Michael, because they were the ones obviously who called the police precinct to let them know that there was this banging and this commotion, you know, happening from downstairs and apparently from our apartment. So that's why they came down with them. But they also, what we learned later, they went to the apartment upstairs and alongside the other side of the hall as well, because we have here uh, six apartments in total on each floor. So they went to the other apartments as well, too. So we have our neighbors upstairs that they went to check on to see what's going on. And so my mother then asked the, our neighbor who lives directly upstairs from us at that time, uh, Miss Leah, uh, if she, you know, had heard anything or whatever at, not that night, and Miss Leah said no, she had heard nothing from our apartment, no noise, no nothing. Obviously the police went and knocked on her door or whatever, and they asked her questions or whatever, nothing. They went over to our other neighbor on the other side of the hall, you know, there or so. And so they went to see uh, a dot, you know, there. So they you know, woke up Miss Dot there and she said, no, I haven't heard anything. No noise, no, no banging, no screaming, no nothing or whatever. 
So then from what Miss Leah then said or whatever, I guess the police told her or whatever, and that as well was, well, we got a call you know, to our precinct saying that there was a lot of noise happening, there was banging and noise and whatever, and that there was screaming, you know, also coming from the floor below, and I guess from our apartment, and they heard all this tremendous commotion, and that's why they came. And so my mother was saying, oh my God, you know, nothing of the sort, you know, happened, obviously. We were asleep, or so we thought. And so then my mother saw Mr. D and ex asked him about the experience, and he told her, you know, that, no, because we heard this banging, we heard this, but we also heard, because he's married with his wife and his baby you know, at the time in that apartment, but apparently Mr. D and Michael also said that in the middle of the night during the storm or whatever, they heard noise on the roof and they heard apparently people walking or running or whatever on the roof and they heard running apparently walking perhaps back and forth on the roof of our building now that's interesting because for a few things number one it was a rain, a, a major rainstorm with thunder and lightning happening that evening. Two, the door to the roof. In our building, all of the doors to the roofs are secured, and they're locked, and they're alarmed. They're not necessarily locked, but they all have alarms on them. So when you open that door, whether from the inside going to the roof or if you are on the roof and you open it to get to you know the staircase the stairwell there the alarm sounds off instantly and it is loud so loud you hear it throughout the whole building so there was no alarm throughout that night the police went and checked first of all when they got there they went up the stairs they got up to the stairs, you know, to the entrance of the roof. The door was open. No alarm sounded the entire time. None of the people on the sixth floor especially heard it, and they're the ones that are closest to that. We would have all heard it throughout the building, because that's how loud that alarm is. The alarm did not sound, but the door was open. When the door is open, the alarm should be sounding endlessly. It doesn't stop. That was peculiar in itself. The police, I guess, went to check the, the roof. They saw nothing. You're there. We have a building that, you know, has, you know, two sides you know, to, the, to the building. So we have our A side where we live, and we have the B side. And this, in the middle, you know, is all that roof, and then you go to the B side, you know, there. So it's not a small building. And again, there was nothing there to indicate that there was anyone there, except that the door was open on our side and no one heard any alarm. So that was strange, odd as well there. No one knew what to make of it. The police didn't know what to make of it either. Yet, our neighbors there heard people walking back and forth, or running back and forth. They were very adamant and very clear about it. And then all the commotion, all the noise that happened, apparently from our apartment, you know, happening with all the screaming and the banging and whatever. Again, nothing of the sort happened. All of this, very strange to say the least, highly unusual. So my mother and I talked about it the next day, you know, and she told me what was relayed to her from the neighbors. I was like, I don't know what to make it, but I'm putting things together. Oh my God, just knew this is some experience that we've had, but it didn't happen really in this realm, this reality. It happened some, or so I think. It, I saw it or I experienced it in an altered state. I'll put it that way. In the astral thing, the subconscious state whatever you call it, on another dimensional you know, state of being. 
if there was screaming, if there was banging, if if these p beings came to us and there was like all this fear, all this screaming, all this frightening, whatever, I don't remember it in the experience. I remember being frightened and being tried to be intimidated by the people that came, but I wasn't screaming. I didn't show any fear. I wasn't in a state of acting like I was, you know, scared or running in the apartment or whatever, nothing, and my mother wasn't either. If anything, I was composed, assessed the situation rapidly, knew what was happening, these people are here to as whatever, and I knew not to, and not to allow this. I've had too much experiences in the past uh, with other experiences that can be considered paranormal as well before, you know, that I experienced a lot of that type of stuff. And I knew what not to do, which is to be frightened when things like this occur. And even though it had been a very long time since I had had a paranormal experience of this sort, and at that time, really when I did have that, that was more when I was a child. And the few times that I had something in between, I knew better than that not to be taken by this type of stuff and immediately come out of it. Uh, this one was different, but I knew what to do. And because I was able to be strong about it and to overcome my fear, you know, it helped the experience for me and for my mother. But there was no screaming, no violence, no trauma, no banging of anything, no abuse. We weren't violated in any way as far as I know. We weren't taken as far as I know, at least as far as I know. But the experience out here in this realm you know, of reality indicates something else or something different. I don't remember that. I have heard too many people who have had experiences of this sort in the realm of paranormal, in the realm of UFO extraterrestrial experience that report similar experiences happening to them. And they remember, but they remember, you know, how frightening and how paralyzed they were. They remember seeing beings as well, but they also remember somehow being either taken into some light, some portal, or taken by these beings, and then being taken aboard some craft or crafts of some kind. Nothing of the sort happened here, as far as I can remember. It did not happen that way, as far as I can remember. What I have just relayed to all of you here is everything that I remember of the experience. Nothing more, nothing else. Now, if something else did happen, that's been apparently wiped from my memory, and certainly from my mother, because she didn't remember anything of this kind happening. She was having apparently a peaceful evening or night to sleep. If she heard the thunder and lightning, it was anything that, you know, woke her up so much that she went back to sleep. But she did not have any traumatizing experience. Zero for her. I was the one who went through that. And I certainly wasn't traumatized, as I said again. I wasn't, you know, affected by it in that way or whatever. I don't remember anything violent happening or being taken or us being taken of any kind in any way whatsoever. What I have told you here in this program is what I remember and what transpired. And as you can see and hear, it was all very linear, very well detailed. It went what seemed like the course of an entire night. And even though I was waking up and going to sleep and going back into the experience again, but it was a very linear experience that occurred. It had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the ending was very pleasant, if anything. Quite the opposite. What else transpired? Like I said, if it was somehow, if it's in my memory or so, and it's been blocked, I, all these years later, I don't remember anything of the kind. I've I'd like to go into it to see if I can somehow unlock something if such a thing happened. So far, nothing. Zero. I don't know. I know that people who have had similar type of experiences or so, you do have blockage 
that has been placed there also to them, and they remember certain things or certain fragments of things. And then it may come to them afterward or later on, or they have bad dreams or nightmares or something starts happening to them. They start feeling different. For us, we were left the same as we were before the experience happened. Nothing unusual, nothing strange or different. We've remained the same always before and we've remained the same always afterwards since. But different people, different experiences happen in different ways for everyone. If somehow something of that sort happened more than what I remember, I don't know or I don't know yet. Who knows if it'll ever surface? Who knows if it'll come about? Who knows if I ever delve into it again, if somehow I can tap into something and see if I can open up something in my memory of whatever or unblock that, whatever is in place there, if, if there is anything that has been placed there to see if anything else has happened. But right now, this is what has occurred, this is what I recall, and this is what I can present to you this evening, talking about this experience. Now, I have uh, spoken about this a few times in the past. I have done some lectures in the last few years with audiences, and I've spoken a bit about this experience from time to time in public. I've also talked a bit about it also in other programs that I've presented here, you know, uh, throughout the last, what, three years or so. I've touched upon it or so, I've explained something. So this is certainly not the first time I've spoken publicly about this experience. But this is the first time I have, you know, presented an entire program devoted to presenting about it, you know, entirely. I wanted to do this program because I felt, I just felt compelled. It's the anniversary of the experience. It was just, what, May 26, two days ago. And something very strong came over me about this experience this year, at this time. And, you know, remembering it and recalling it the last few weeks. And I felt that it was important somehow that I needed to record you know this and record it you know, here and have it placed you know, here on the internet and in video form so that you know people can see this first of all and hear about it and hopefully it will somehow touch upon whoever's watching this out there and to see if they if it anything that makes sense to them if They've had an experience of this kind in some way or similar um, to share this so that people who are frightened about talking about things of this kind don't feel that they're so not necessarily so alone because we have more and more people coming out more than ever before talking about things of this kind as we've seen in the last several years you just go into any paranormal program now that you see and there are people talking about things like this left and right now more than ever before and I've talked about this type of thing already you know previous in other programs about people you know coming on television now and telling about their experiences whether it's UFO related whether it's paranormal whether they have been visited by ghosts or spirits or demons or angels or whatever and people are talking about this and they're willing to come forth and discuss this publicly more and more like never before they're not so afraid about being ridiculed, about being, you know, thought of that they're crazy, and that they're mentally troubled, they're mentally disturbed, and they should all be in a mental hospital, and they need help, and we all need medication, and we shouldn't talk about things of that kind because we're all crazy, and which is one of the reasons why I kept quiet about this type of stuff for so long, you know, for a good portion of my life here, and I've had several lots of experiences in the past since childhood about this as many of you who are regularly see my program know and I didn't speak that that much about it publicly either because I didn't want people thinking that I was crazy and when I did talk about it from time to time they'd look at me kind of like strange or weird or whatever and thought that I was you know there was something that I was mentally ill and that I needed you know help 
and that I needed, you know, perhaps medication or, you know, or talk to somebody, a psychiatrist or whatever about these things. That's, you know, the normal response to all of this, you know, for all of our lives, because most people, it seems, don't have these type of experiences, or so we thought. Now we're learning more and more that more and more people have had these types of experiences in one way or another. They were just, as I was, uh, too frightened, too afraid to talk about it because we didn't want to be ridiculed. We didn't want to be considered, you know, something weird, strange, peculiar, or something wrong with us. So we kept quiet. And even to this day, there's still many people that still don't talk about these things. A lot of people that do still feel uncomfortable, still feel frightened, still feel frightened that they're going to be ostracized, shunned from society, from their family, from their friends, acquaintances. That does happen. It's happened so much before. It still happens now. And But we're also learning that more and more people are talking about this. It still looks like more people don't have these types of experiences happen to them than those that do. Or it seems that way. Because a lot of them may still be very frightened about being open about this yet. But, again, we do see more and more people and hear more and more people coming out with it and talking about these things. That's a big help for everyone. It's a big help to all of us. It's a big help for people who are too scared to talk about this, to see that they're not alone. They're not the only ones. They're not, they shouldn't feel crazy. They shouldn't feel frightened. They shouldn't feel that there's something wrong with them. That these things do happen and happen a lot. And have happened to a lot, for, to a lot of people for a very long time. And we need to stop being afraid of talking about this. And we need to get out there. We need to talk about our experiences. And we need to be open about this more and more because we need to help other people who are still scared, who still feel frightened about themselves, about their sanity, you know, to admit and to see that this is real, that they don't have to be scared or frightened. They can talk about it. And they should talk about it, even to one person who they can feel that they can trust it, that won't think that they are insane or crazy or whatever. We have a lot of people, you know, that are very healthy people, very well mentally, who have had incredible experiences. They've said this a lot. I've seen it all the time. I know people because being in the field of spiritual, the metaphysical, I've had the good fortune of knowing a lot of fascinating people who have had incredible experiences, whether they are psychics, mediums, professionals, healers, in these fields, but also from regular people who are not part of this experience or part of this field, but they talk about this. They have opened up about it. They go to these events. They go to lectures. They go to see uh, spirituals, people, psychics, mediums. They come to see people like us, you know, for readings, to hear about lectures, to see presentations, and they talk about it there they do open up about these experiences because they feel that it's safe they feel that they can talk about it there because they know that people there will believe them that they're like-minded they will understand but we have to get this out more in the open we have to talk more about these things more and more it's empowering It'll help us understand. It'll help us open our minds more. It'll help us perhaps even tap in to more of this type of experience more and more. It'll elevate us as people, as spirits. We'll get stronger and hopefully better connections. Maybe that's what these other beings want for us. They want us to connect with them, to be open more about this, to accept all of this more, to hear more about it because it'll help them be able to present themselves to us. There are too many people that are still too frightened, which is part of the reason why none of these beings or whatever so really come through in the masses and finally reveal themselves in whatever way they exist, because it's still too frightening. The majority of people 
are not ready for this. They can't accept this. They don't believe this still. So it seems. It would be too much for them. Too much of a shock. Too much of a shock for the world. Too difficult to understand, to comprehend, to connect with. It'd be too much of a traumatizing experience for too many people yet. And that is perhaps the main reason why we still have this separation of these other beings out there, these other people out there, whatever you may call them, and the people here, and the beings here, in this realm of reality, in this world. But it's making progress. It's evolving. It's opening up more and more. It just apparently needs more time. I wanted to do this program because I wanted to get this experience out there, to have it recorded always, to put it out in the internet, to put it here on Facebook Live, to put it on YouTube so it reaches even more and more people who hopefully will watch this broadcast, hear about it, hear me tell my story, and hear about my experience, and hopefully they can relate. They can hear about it and see and understand, and they can feel more comfortable about themselves or more comfortable talking about it to others about their experiences, whether it's similar, whether it's the same, whether how unusual, and just, again, to get it out there, to get this information out there so for people to learn, for people to know. And hopefully it will help others. And hopefully it will educate us and hopefully it will help to evolve us. And just one more person telling my story, telling my experience to help put that out there to help evolve all of this, to help find, get the breakthrough that so many of us have been hoping for, and finally making connections with the other side, the other realms, the other beings from other places, other worlds, other realities, other dimensions, other planets, to finally, you know, we can all finally connect and acknowledge that we're all here and we're all real and we are all in this. It's all real. We are all real. That is my hope you know, for this program you know, here. So, to add more to the experience, um, as time went on, uh, we learned again that um, all of this commotion happened and we talked about it a bit more, but then we never really spoke that much about it again. Uh, the neighbors didn't really elaborate further about it. Um, I never got the chance to ask Mr. D or Michael about it because I didn't see them that much. And I felt, unfortunately, I felt uncomfortable about approaching them with the subject. Because even still at that time, and even me being who I am, because at that point I was working as a professional psychic, a professional spirit intuitive. Um, but I felt uncomfortable asking them about it, about the experience. I felt that they would think that it was weird or that it would be uncomfortable or for them. I didn't. I just felt uncomfortable asking them which is very unfortunate. I regret that terribly. I should have asked them. But that's the nature of this type of experience. You become so accustomed to being so quiet about it and so afraid of talking about this. Even though I wasn't going to mention the spiritual side, I wasn't going to tell them about the experience that I had, just ask them questions of what they experienced about it. But for some reason, I just didn't because I felt I shouldn't. I felt uncomfortable. I didn't want to I just didn't want something held me back. It was, again, that fear of talking about this type of thing that holds us back, even held me back. That's been the problem. So being so afraid of talking about this. That, that's that been a major problem with why all of this has been made to feel that, you know, people like us that have these types of things are crazy. 
because we hear so much about the people who have talked about it in the past. Yes, some of them became well known, some of them had books on it, some of them became renowned with it and started, had careers doing lectures and traveling all over the place, all over the world, all over the country, etc. You know, became famous with this, being interviewed on television shows, on talk shows, documentaries made about them throughout the years. There's a lot of those people that are still you know, actively being successful in supporting themselves, you know, talking about their experience. And they go about to various conventions, various talk shows, documentaries, cable television shows that devote entire programs to them. They've written books on their subjects. They've become very well known. This is their livelihood. And this is what they do. And they become successful doing that. And people who've known for years doing this already. And more and more that are coming out doing this. Um, this isn't my experience in doing that. I don't think people are going to look at this so much and, oh, wow, somebody's going to approach me. I want to do an interview and get me on television or whatever. No, because there's a lot of people that are doing these types of um, videos out there on the Internet. And they're putting it out there, such as I'm doing this evening. And none of them have been approached, as far as I know, you know, by news reporters or television or interviewers to be on their broadcast or be, you know, interviewed by them or this and that or whatever. There's a lot of them, you know. And that hasn't happened to them. And I don't expect that to happen here, you know, either. But this is just one more voice getting it out there, hopefully just to help others to get it out there to see that they can connect with this for them to learn about it. Who, people who are skeptical about this, who think that I'm crazy or whatever, so be it. Those who are skeptical are hearing this, at least who have an open mind, or at least hopefully even those that think I'm crazy, but just to have an open mind about it, that helps. That helps. There's too many of us with this type of thing happening to us. Or has, that has happened to us. Way too many of us. For too many years. Decades. Hundreds of years. Thousands of years. More. Who knows more. Happening to us. We're just now, the public is now starting to really get more comfortable hearing this and acknowledging this. And being more open about it and having more open minds about this to think about it and to look at it and to see that this can be a real possibility that this can be real and that's what the purpose of this presentation is about to get it out there so, years have gone by, you know, from this experience. Nothing else has happened along those lines ever since. And, but that happens as well. This can be just a one-time experience. I'm not the only one who's had this. And then nothing else ever happens like this. Afterward, it's like a one-time thing. And we've been fine you know, ever since. Um, during the future or so now we still live in the same you know place same apartment everything is fine um, as for the other people who are involved with this um, our neighbor Marion who lives across from our apartment who I saw the pink be the pink beings you know, the pink elephantine beings were floating from um, still lives in the same apartment with her husband they're fine uh, our neighbors upstairs, uh, Mr. D, after a few years, he, his wife, you know, um, Carol and their baby son, you know, moved, you know, from there. And um, they moved out to Long Island to a beautiful home, apparently, out there. They've been fine, I guess, ever since there. I must also tell that Mr. D was a gentleman who was not prone to the strange or the weird and unusual. This is a very, you know, normal person you know, here as well. He's an older individual. Um, Mr. D is a very serious, very nice, you know, person. Um, he's a very successful, uh, from what I recall, uh, automobile uh, uh, salesman working with high-end you know, automobile sales. So he, you know, he were his place of work, they sold very expensive, you know, automobiles. 
So this was a businessman, always dressed in a suit and tie. I used to see him all the time coming home from work or whatever. He was always dressed in a suit with a tie. He worked in a very prestigious, you know, uh, place you know, there. And very normal person, not prone to unusual or weird behavior or strange, not at all. Me and his wife, you know, fine, lovely people. Michael was also a very lovely person as well. A very normal person, again, not prone to strange or weird or unusual behavior. Nobody was mentally troubled here or mentally disturbed. Working people. Um, Michael was a, one of the loveliest neighbors we ever had, you know, living here. Very friendly, very warm. My One of my mother's favorite, you know, neighbors here. Very kind. Uh, my mother learned a bit later on from there that actually Michael was an undercover police officer and worked obviously for the NYPD for years but never really spoke about his profession too much but mother just knew about that and, she, and mother he talked once and he kind of alluded to the fact that indeed that he was an undercover you know police officer plain clothes officer you know for years so that was interesting to hear because that could have made sense as to why you know and he heard all this noise or whatever. He apparently called the police precinct because he's part of the NYPD, and they responded you know, so well, you know, also that night. Uh, afterward, Michael, unfortunately, a few years after the experience, unfortunately, Michael suddenly passed away. I do believe he was like 50 years old when he passed, and he passed from a heart condition. Uh, we were very, very sorry, you know, when this happened. Very, very sorry. Because, again, he was just the loveliest, kindest person. Always had a smile on his face. Just a wonderful person. And uh, we learned that he had had a heart condition for many years, you know, prior to that. So you never would never see it, you know, looking at him. He always looked so healthy and so well. He was young. And that, again, he just passed away suddenly. And that was uh, very unfortunate, you know, to, that that happened, and and to hear obviously, you know, from us here. Our other neighbors upstairs, we also had neighbors that they uh, talked to upstairs, Mr. and Mrs. Green, that were upstairs on sixth floor. The neighbors who lived in the middle between Mr. D and Michael, actually, they also the police went to them and they heard nothing from what they recall. They said nothing was there, um, nothing. Odd, you know, from their end, they didn't experience anything. And years have passed now, and Mrs. Glee passed away a few, several years ago at this point. And Mr. Glee lived on here till about, I say, about four or five years ago. Then he finally moved. He lived here for very longer than us, and we've lived here forever. And he finally, you know, moved. He became too old and kind of frail. So it appears that his family, you know, uh, took care of him, and he had to move you know, from here, but it was very recent, I said, maybe like four years or so, and just before the pandemic, that he finally, you know, moved, and then we heard later on, and unfortunately, by the last year or so, that he had passed, you know, also, but he was an elder person, and had fallen ill, you know, at, before that as well, too. Um, our upstairs neighbor, uh, Ms. Leah, uh, after a few years from the experience of 2004, she was an elder, older person as well, and she needed help as well, so she couldn't live on her own. She had been a widow by that time already. And she and her daughter, you know, were there. Her daughter, her daughters, she had two very good daughters that would always watch for her and take care of her, so in and out, but they lived in their own homes. But Miss Leah apparently just became too elder and too sick as well, and uh, they helped her move, you know, away, you know, too. Uh, Dot, however, is still living here also. So she still remains in her same apartment on the sixth floor, same place. And she comes and goes. She's had a home you know, in another state from here for many years. So she lives a lot at that house you know, out there, but comes back periodically, especially in the summer, spring and summer. So she's more here you know, at her apartment you know, up here. So we get to see her. You know, often or fairly often, when she does come back, especially then she goes away, especially for the winter, she'll go back to her home, you know, out there. 
but she's still around but she never really spoke much about experience either afterward and also so that's what has transpired what has taken place since you know that time it was quite a while ago obviously this was 2004 and we're now here in 2023 so that was quite a while ago and as I said nothing else of that kind has ever transpired again at least not yet because with one thing I have learned with this type of experience and with working in the spirit as I have for so many years at this time you never know when something can happen again out of nowhere so I'm always open and always watching and always on the alert to see what else may come whether from this particular experience or something else you never know when out of nowhere suddenly something comes to you something happens again or new always be aware always keep open but relax live your life as you do I know you will <laughs> I know I do but because again I do work in this realm of things I'm always vigilant always aware always alert always open to things and seeing what may come in the future. So, with that, I will leave you for this evening. And we will see each other again in a future program. So, hopefully everybody has a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. And have a pleasant and wonderful evening. So everyone, I wish you good night.